Today we're going to turn the ghost of an extinct tree. All right, so you're probably thinking that I've lured you in here and I'm tricking you with some kind of cute little trick as far as a ghost of an extinct tree and that, but I'm not. This is the remnants and an offshoot of an American chestnut tree. The very American chestnut tree that was made extinct or virtually extinct about a hundred years ago. At one point there are estimates that there were four billion American chestnut trees growing from Maine to Florida along the Appalachian Mountains. Four billion. And now Nobody knows, but they, there may be a couple hundred that still exist. None of the large growth ones that once were part of American history. There were trees that were so large they matched some of the redwoods on the west coast as far as their girth and their width and the amount of lumber that they would produce. Not only was the American chestnut tree super important for lumber in early America, but it was also an amazing food source, both for wildlife and for people. So the American chestnut tree being erased by the blight was a, was a horrific thing. But what's incredible is there are massive sections where chestnuts have come down, but their root system still exists and it still is trying to grow and it sends up shoots this is one of those shoots. Now you're probably asking, how do I have this? Well, I know a gentleman that has a property in Virginia and he gets to watch these shoots come up because he has one of those old root systems from an, from an ancient chestnut tree. Unfortunately, these trees only grow up, and this one looks like it might be 15 or 20 years old. They only grow up so big and then they get taken down by the blight as well. But the tree and the root system doesn't give up. Trees are absolutely amazing. If you're, if you're intrigued at all about trees and if you love history, then there's a really cool book that I would love you to check out. It's called The Hidden Life of Trees. I'm going to put a link in the description below. You're going to want to read this book because it's incredible. It has to do more with trees in Europe, um, but it all pertains to the same amazingness that trees have. So the American chestnut tree no longer exists, but I've got a little piece of it here. And unfortunately, this is all I have. I don't have like a stack of them. Normally when I turn, I've got a big stack of different pieces. So I got to tell you, I'm a little nervous about turning this. I If it doesn't turn out, then yeah, I'm a little, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I could probably get another piece, but I... I I'm a little intimidated by this chunk of woods. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this. I'm going to make a natural edge bowl out of this, a small natural edge with this. I don't know what the condition of this bark is. It looks kind of dry and brittle. I've Again, I have no experience turning American chestnut. How would I? Um, so I'm just going to have to learn as I go and kind of take it slow and get a feel for how this wood's going to turn. I'm a little concerned we've got a, a little separation between some of these these younger rings and the and the center here. I don't know if that's going to separate. I don't know if the bark's going to stay on. I'm going to try to get keep the bark on, but if it doesn't, that's fine. We can have a nice natural edge. Natural edge is without bark and live edge is with bark. That's typically how we call those. So, let's go ahead and get started and see what see what we get out of this. So, I'm going to start off by marking the center of the log and getting a good idea where the center portion of this is. Typically I would take a chisel and a mallet and I would just knock off some of that bark in the middle, but I'm not really sure how secure this bark is, so I'm going to drill through it a little bit with a Forstner bit. This is going to give me the ability to hopefully not break anything off that I don't need to, and I've got a good flat area there for the chuck to attach to at the lathe. So what I'm going to start off with is a four spur chuck. And the four spur chuck is just a really simple friction fit chuck that goes in the Morris taper. And I'm going to bring the tailstock up and then that's going to apply pressure and hold the bull blank in place. Now the real advantage of using the four spur chuck is I'm going to be able to easily make minor adjustments to this blank, especially at the beginning when I'm first setting this up. What I'm doing here is I'm checking to make sure that the tops of the log 
or the bull blank are going to match on both sides. And here you can see that side is a little higher. So what I do is I simply loosen up the tail stock, move the blank just, just a bit, tighten it back up, and then check it again. I'm just holding my thumb in one location making sure those two edges match. And once I'm there, I tighten down the tail stock. Now remember, don't smash your hand into the lever of the tail stock or any other uh, fasteners or tightening levers on the lathe. Use a tool like that so you're not damaging your hand. So now I'm going to position the tool rest and get that in position to start knocking down these corners and rounding off this bull blank. But before I do that, I really need to sharpen my bull gouge. Typically, you always want to sharpen your bull gouge before you turn and right at your last finishing cut as well as any times you need in between. And all we're doing is we're not grinding and this is it's kind of an easy misconception because of the it appears like a grinder but basically we we're, we're sharpening we're just taking that bevel edge and smoothing it up right up to the cutting edge and that's it. It's going to be a very small amount of material that comes off. Now if you need more information about shaping or sharpening tools, be sure to check out my tool sharpening e-course. I'll have a link below in the description. You can check that out. So with any bowl blank, you want to take the speed up slow. Start slow and then bring the speed up. And because this is rectangular, it's going to be not as balanced as it's going to be later. So I'm not going to be turning this very fast right now. Go ahead and check out my Go ahead and check out my lathe speed video if you've got questions about what speed is best while you're turning. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking my half inch bull gouge. Now there's a half inch, the diameter of the shaft of this bull gouge is a half inch. The flute is 3 8 of an inch. And I'm making just small cuts to take down the corners of this piece. And as I do that, I'm going to need to move the tool rest in so I've got good support as I progress in taking this curve down. Just going to make light cuts and move across. We're going to be cutting a lot of air. With all the natural edge or live edge bowls, you're going to be turning a lot of air, meaning that there's going to be a tool will be engaged in wood and then we'll have a gap before the next section of wood comes around. And that takes a little bit of getting used to, but you, what you want to remember is your tool control and keeping the bull gouge on path with the tool rest and not with the bull itself. And what do I mean by that? What I'm doing here, and again, there's more adjusting, keeping that tool rest close so we've got good support. But what I'm doing is I'm making sure that my left hand is applying down force on the tool rest. My left hand is not trying to steer or drive or move this bull gouge at all. All of the movement is coming from the shift of my body weight. I'm flexed my knees and I'm shifting my weight. In this particular cut, I'm, I go a little bit right of center and I, I'm shifting my body weight to center and a little bit left of center. So the position you see the tool rest right now, my feet are in front of that tool rest and parallel with it. And my body's in about the center part of that cut and I'm just simply making a lean from right to left. And as I make that lean, I'm just allowing that bull gouge to glide across the top of that tool rest. I really don't care where the bull is underneath it. Well, of course I do. I want the curve to be right. But I'm not pressing into the bull or anything of that nature, especially when you have big gaps um, like we do with a natural edge. If you push into it, what will happen is you'll push forward when there's no wood there, and then the next section of wood coming around is going to smack the heck out of your tool, and you really don't want that. So you want to have really nice, controlled, smooth cuts as you go across here. This is kind of neat too because there's there's a frequency thing happening between the lights and the camera. Um, there's a frequency which allows us right now in the video to see the rotation of that bull. And you can see where there's gaps in it. The bull is turning a lot faster than it appears in this video. And when you see it in person, it's more of a blur versus this. You're actually picking up the rhythm because of the frequency of the light. So you can actually see that gap going by. So here I'm going to smooth out the bottom portion of the bowl and get ready to produce a tenon. And I'm just going to make a push cut from the exterior across the face. And that's going to smooth out that material. And I'm going to use my dividers to mark the width of my tenon. 
I'm being very careful just to touch the left point and not the right. I'm using the right point to, as a guide to see that that line is positioned over the right one, but the right one never touches because it would get flipped forward. So now I'm going to remove material down to the shoulder, which is going to form our first cylinder, which will be the tenon. That's what we're seeing in the middle here. And now I'm going to remove some more material and leave a shoulder area here. If you want to learn more about making tenons, be sure to check out my perfect tenon video so you can see all of the details about making a tenon. A tenon is probably the most important thing you can make when you're turning a bowl because you really want a good solid secure connection when you get to that four jaw chuck. So we have two cylinders. The top small one is for the tendon and the second one is the, the shoulder. And the reason I do the shoulder like that is it allows me later to come back in and make a custom foot area. I will remove that tendon completely and I'll remove part of that shoulder and shape the foot of the bull in that. And depending on how much wood you have, you can make that shoulder deeper so you have more material later to play with the foot. Here I'm using a detail spindle gouge to cut inward and make the angled dovetail portion of the tenon. And I'm doing an undercut there to make sure that area is nice and clean so the forejaw chuck can grip onto it properly. Now that we've established the tenon in the shoulder area, we can clearly see where the curve of the base of this bowl needs to be shaped. So I'm going to continue removing the material around the exterior of the bowl itself. You see I'm using downforce with that left hand on the tool rest. I just lost a chunk of bark there. I'm afraid the bark is not going to hold on to this bowl and we're just going to have to call it. This is going to be a natural edge at this point because I know that that piece that went by and actually you can see it here in the video which is pretty incredible. You can see that one part that's flapping there. There's no way you can see that with your eye. But here you can see that it's it's relatively loose and we lost a big section of it there. I'm going to take some of that off. And we'll just go ahead and keep shaping it. It'll be okay. We'll make this a, a beautiful natural edge piece. Now I move my controller to the left side of the lathe because my body is on that side. I want to be able to get to the controller as much as possible. What I'm doing here is I'm doing a scraping cut. This is a little bit more aggressive cut. It's not giving a really nice smooth finish, but it removes material quickly. And as I'm doing this, I'm looking down on the shape of the bowl and I'm trying to form the, the curve that's going to be the base of this bowl. And I want to make a nice flowing smooth curve transition from the shoulder, which will be the foot area, up to the sides of the wings. And the scraping cut is great for that. We can make that scraping cut and then quickly shape it. But I'm going to need to go back in and refine those surfaces before we're done. You can see I still need to take the edges up and bring those, draw those wings up all the way to the tops of the ends of the side. So I'm going to need to make some more cuts here. Now I'm going to go ahead and do a push cut that's going to remove a, a bunch of the material up on the wings itself. I'm making a little bit of an aggressive cut here. I'm starting to get a much wider path there. So what I did is I backed out so that I've got a portion of that. You want to make sure you don't overload the bull gouge. It's a good way to get a catch. You want to make light cuts and just kind of know the limits of your bull gouge. Here again, I'm removing material. I'm not looking for a, a nice finished cut at this moment, but I, I just looking to get material out of the way. So I know that what I'm doing when I take big bites like this is not leaving the smoothest surface underneath it. And that's okay at this, at this point in the game. It's kind of neat here. You can see the, um, I'm picking up that line and you can see that again for that that frequency of the light in the camera you can see that the that void going by versus the the actual edge where I'm cutting just being really careful here to match up the previous cutting edge and just follow that outward and I'm going to continue to refine that curve I'm getting it I've got it roughed out pretty well but obviously there's some, some high spots and some angles on that we need to smooth those out. So I'm going to go ahead and 
pull the scraping cut to shape this again to make these sides curve and contour the way I want them to. That peeling shaving coming off the bull gouge is really nice. You want that most of the time. That's a good indication that that wing is cutting and not scraping. It's technically a scrape, but it's, it's actually cutting. Okay, now I'm going to do a, a shear scrape. If you see, I've dropped the handle. I have it clear down on my hip, and the bull gouge is pointed upward. And what I'm doing is I'm with the bull gouge at that angle. It's almost a 40, 45 degree angle. Only a very small portion of that lower ring, or lower wing, is engaged on the surface of the wood, and it's literally shaving that surface. So any of those little high spots in that, I'm just shaving those off, just very delicately. And this is a great way to get a really nice, smooth finish on a piece of wood. And um, you, if you, if this is done well, depending on the condition of the wood itself, you can start at a really fine grit sandpaper when you get to the sanding portion of the bowl. So I'm just making really light cuts and this is what the shavings will look like when you do that uh, shear scrape. So I've got the shear scrape going there. There's a little bit of high spot there. I still have to refine that. Now it may seem like I'm fussing here. I actually am fussing here because there's I'm, I don't want to mess up this piece of, ch of American chestnut. The American chestnut's incredible. You know when I was I had the first opportunity um, it's been years ago. I was in Spain in November and I was walking through with our family through this little village and there was a there was a guy that had a barrel, a stove, and he was roasting chestnuts. And of course we all hear the song roasting chestnuts over an open fire as kids and all that sort of stuff. And you don't really realize that's part of American history, but it really is or it was. Um, so it was really cool. So we got this little this little bag of chestnuts we were walking. Here I'm I'm not really pleased with the curve of this. It's a little more um, it's sticking out a little more than I want. So I'm going to refine that a little bit more. I'm going to take that curve down. So these chestnuts were in this little paper bag and they were just blazing hot. And I had no idea what to expect. And they're they're really unique. They're kind of a soft texture. If you've ever had chestnuts, um, the chestnuts that we have are, and what those were in Spain are, are Italian chestnuts. They're not American chestnuts. And what people say about the American chestnuts is they were sweeter. And I actually enjoy the Italian chest, chestnuts. Anyway, so ever since then, it's kind of been a tradition in our house. I always get chestnuts. And, and if you go to the market in the produce section around Thanksgiving and Christmas, because there are recipes that people have for like dressing and things like that, stuffing for turkeys and that, that use chestnuts. You can find chestnuts in some grocery stores. Well, basically, you just split with a knife, you just make an X on the flat side of the chestnut and roast them until they pop open. And then, oh my gosh, they're, it's it's a really fun little tradition that we have. Anyway, so that's, I can't even imagine. I mean, there's stories of immigrants coming to the United States and explaining that they were so amazed at the freedom that we have here in America and also how they could go to a city park and basically fill their pockets with food and they were talking about collecting chestnuts and they would they would use them as food and they could be ground and made you could make flour out of them you could do all kinds of different things you could eat them as as they were but they were it was just this amazing source of protein and nutrition that was available and of course that all disappeared when the blight wiped out the american chestnut so what i'm doing here is um, I'm just, just trying to make a really nice clean cut across the top of those wings and smooth out that, that area. It looks like the lathe was going slow there, but it wasn't. Again, it's part of that, the light and the camera creating a flash. Now, if you get a high spot like this, I've got the curve of this exterior pretty much the way I want. But I've got these two little high spots. And instead of making deep cuts there and, and ruining everything that I've made so far, I want to make really light cuts, but I need to see exactly where those are. Go ahead and make a pencil mark there. It makes it real easy for you to see that later. Once it starts um, turning, you can see exactly where those pencil marks and just concentrate on those areas until they're smoothed out. Now, fussing with the exterior of the bowl might seem like a little bit of overkill here, but in all reality, this bowl and every bowl, the exterior is the bowl. The exterior, 99% of the time, drives and defines the interior shape of the bowl. So the more time you spend on the exterior, the better your bowl is going to be. 
All right, so those cracks up in that lower, those lower growth rings, we need to address. And I'm going to show you this technique that I use. I use uh, a tight bond wood glue. And what you do is you drive that glue down into those cracks. If you want to learn more about this technique, you can check out this article I have on my website. Go to turnawoodbowl.com forward slash crack. And you'll get all the details there about it. But essentially what happens is you fill this in and you basically just put enough glue there that it's going to go down into that crack. And you take a, a relatively coarse sandpaper, maybe 100, 150 grit sandpaper, and just sand it along with the grain. And what happens is that sanding and the little dust it creates will kind of skim over the top of it and fill it in. And it's you don't have to wait for it to dry. When I first heard this technique, I'm like, I don't want to use wood glue on my bowl. I'll have to like wait all night for this to dry and then come back and turn it tomorrow. I want to get this bowl done. He's like, no, no. He just basically, uh, Gary from our turning club explained, showed me this trick, and it's a really, really good trick. And so you basically just force that down in there really good. That's probably more than I needed to put on there. You just need enough to get down in the crack. Sometimes you can use some shavings there to kind of get some of the, the excess off and just sand along with the grain and it's going to fill that crack. It basically acts like a, an instant putty and a little bit of sawdust or shavings that you're making as you're sanding um, just covers over the top of that glue. So check out that technique. It's pretty cool. We're going to do it again in just a little bit on the inside of this because we definitely need to repair those areas and we don't want those cracks to expand or continue. So at this point, I'm, I'm starting at the 120 grit sandpaper, and I'm just carefully going around and smoothing off any areas with high spots or tool marks or things of that nature and smoothing down the surface. If we don't do that with the first sandpaper. Any kind of tool marks or any kind of grooves or anything that were created will just continue to progress as we sand. So we really want to take our time and, and look closely. Use your light source. If you need to move your light source to the side, you'll be able to see that better. If you want to learn all about how I sand, check out my article, or my, rather my video here on YouTube about sanding bowls. And I go into all the detail of this, but you get that light there on the side, you can see the, the high spots and the tool marks really well. And just take your time and smooth those out and they'll come right down. Now this chestnut, I gotta tell you, I'm really enjoying it because it's, it's a, a relatively hard wood. It's lightweight. It sands really well and it's, um, it's just it's just really nice it's it's becoming a little more unfortunate that these aren't available because uh, it would be a nice uh, wood source to have on a regular basis now i turned this tenon a little bit larger than i should have tip and i i teach to make your tenons the same size as your dovetails and in reality this is a five millimeter about a um about a two inch uh, chuck here and I should be closing this down a little bit tighter but I'm not I'm, I'm keeping a little bit wider because I want to have a little bit more support if I made this a little two inch tenon on this bowl it doesn't quite it's going to be a little small for what I'm doing so it's, it's making me a little bit concerned so I, I went ahead and made the tenon just a little bit larger and now I'm going to go ahead and take off the rest of this bark as well uh, I really, I've got basically a four inch and a two inch. I wish that there was a three inch jaw because this this particular size of a bowl would be best suited with a about a three inch tenon, and that's what I was ideally shooting for here. So you can just knock that off. You got to be careful not to um, not to dig into the wood with the chisel as you're knocking that bark off. All right, so now we're going to start removing the interior of the bowl. Now, every time I do a natural edge or a live edge bowl. I work from the outside towards the center and I actually determine my wall thickness first and get that going. And the reason I do that is it gives me much more control to keep the wall and maintain that wall thickness all the way down the, the bowl and it also provides stability. Now this particular piece of wood is pretty dry so I'm not really worried about it, um, its moisture and the um, it flexing but if you were to do this with a wet piece of wood it could flex very easily and after, if you had all of the center gone you would have flexing wings and you don't want that so what I'm doing here now if you look I've got the bevel of the tool parallel with the exterior of the bowl so that bevel edge is lined up with the bowl and the curve that I'm making with my body and my right hands on the same same situation with the left hand the left hand is just making downward pressure on the tool rest but my right hand in this condition is moving the handle of the bowl gouge like a rudder and making that curve. 
And what I'm doing is I'm establishing the thickness of that wall first by making this little ditch or like kind of trough along the side. Again, I bring it up to the to the edge of the bowl and I, I'm looking at the relationship of the bevel of the bowl gouge compared to the exterior of the bowl. And I want to make sure those are parallel all the time. You can just make really light cuts here. Now, the center mass of this bowl is still in place, so the, this bowl is very stable. If this were wet wood, those wings still would not flex much at this point because that interior is a, is a really nice stable mass of wood that helps hold everything in. It's part of the reason why I don't do the reverse. We basically clear out the center until you're down to the final passes for the entire bowl. If you were to do that, there's going to probably going to be a lot of flexing. And if you get a lot of flexing with these wings and the fact that you're cutting air as well, you're not going to be able to make a really good smooth cut because that wood, the out, outside wall when it gets thinner is going to vibrate and it's not going to allow a really good cut. But this technique of working from the wall down is much better. So what we do is you work down the wall a little bit and you commit to it. We're not going back up to that wall anymore. And then you remove a little bit of material from the center like I'm doing here and then you go back to the wall and thin out some more material and take that wall thickness down until you're matching the previous wall thickness. Now, the natural tendency is to look into the bowl like the camera is oriented right now, but what you want to do is you want to stand up tall and you want to look down on the edge of the bowl. Again, you want to line up the flat side of that bevel with the exterior of the bowl. That's what I'm looking at right here. Now, if you notice, I've got the bowl oriented. The flute is very open and you got to be careful doing that because it you can get a, a nasty catch if you if you push the, the gouge into the bowl, but instead you can see I make a really light cut, probably half of a millimeter here, just a very light cut. Use your fingers to check that thickness, and when you get it to the right thickness, then, then stop. It just needs a little bit more taken off. If you look at how much of the bowl gouge edge is engaged, there's just a hair on the top of that curve that's engaged in cutting right there. That feels good. Okay, so now I continue removing more material from the center and taking that center mass down because we don't need it anymore. But I will not return to those side wings. So this is where people get get hung up. Well, and actually right there, there's that crack that, that we were seeing in the outside of the bowl. It goes all the way through the bowl. And those sections, they made a noise and there was a section that came out of there. If you see something that's unusual as you're turning, if there's like a crack or a or a skip or a little sound of some sort, stop and check your material and make sure you know what's going on. Right there you can see another section give way. That's that little seam that's in there between those those particular younger rings on there breaking away. So we know what they are. The bowl seems to be stable. So what, what I was getting at is we're not going to come back up on those walls and turn those wings anymore because now they're kind of free-forming and they're out there on their own. When I've seen many people get in trouble by thinking, well, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and make one more pass all the way from the top of, of the rim of the bowl down to the middle when they're close to being done with this. And because those wings are flexing, as soon as that bowl gouge taps them, they 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 shatter the bowl and the bowl goes flying and that's that's how you ruin a bowl really fast instead remember just commit to what you've turned as you go down the wall and don't go back and take your time and make each section that you're turning match the previous one and you'll have a nice fluid continuous inside shape to this bowl so here I'm taking down and working my way out to that outer wall and it's probably only about an inch section that I'm doing and you can see the cut. I'm being really light on the front edge of that bowl gouge. Now when I get to that center mass, I'm not engaging it because that's way too much material for that bowl gouge and I can get a catch there. So I'm working right up to it there and then stopping. Now I'm going to kind of merge this, the previous gap to this one. The flute is completely open. This only works if you're doing a very controlled, very light cut. You do not want to put the bowl gouge in that orientation if you're trying to make a big, like a roughing cut because you will definitely get a catch. 
All right, so the sidewalls match really well. I'm just going to keep working down the center. You can see there, as I was going, that the amount of wood that I was taking away was going to be too much for it. So I backed out and took a smaller bite. So I wasn't uh, overloading the bull gouge and putting it in a position where it could get a catch. So when I'm making these passes from right to left, I have the bull gouge flute rotated to about the 10 or 10.30 position. If, the, if we say that the flute pointing straight up is a 12 o'clock position, There's that rough area that's got the crack in it, and, and we're going to get that out of the way right there. So I'm going to switch tool rests. I've got a curved tool rest, which is really nice to have, especially for this situation. I can just get that bull gouge in just a little bit closer than I can with a flat tool rest. You definitely want to hand turn the bowl, make sure that it's not going to come into contact with any part of the tool rest. And then get your height set. I've got a video all about tool rest as well if you want to check that out as far as how to position your tool rest. And now the cuts that I'm making to work down to the sidewall are from left to right. And I have the flute in about the 1 to 130 position when I'm making these cuts. Just make light, thin cuts and make sure you're riding the bevel. And when you get down to those final cuts, you want to make sure you've got a good, sharp bowl gouge. So go back to your sharpening station and sharpen up that edge. What I do here is essentially I work one wing than the other and then I kind of roll across the front nose. The only thing I need is I just need a clean, smooth bevel edge right up to the cutting edge and that's it. That's all I'm looking for. You want to have a good light source and check that out. And that's good. So go back to the same position. Now I'm going to a really nice sharp tool. I got a pretty open position there. You can see it was almost at 12 o'clock. And that's just going to go and make a nice smooth cut to take away that material. And now I'm going to work down the remainder of the material in the center of this bowl. There's a really cool story, um, a book called The Overstory. It's it's I, there's part there's part nonfiction in it, but it's it's a it's a fiction it's a novel. But there's a story about a couple that moved from New York to Iowa in the late 1800s or early 1900s, and they moved in the spring. And the fascinating thing was they. They in the winter, the previous winter in New York, they were in one of the parks in New York, and they the gentleman had loaded his pockets with chestnuts. And when winter came around in Iowa, they got their coats out and they found all these chestnuts, and he decided to plant some of them in Iowa. And this the way the story goes, and, I, and there's stories of this happening too. That there's there's chestnut trees that are not in the Appalachian area that have survived the blight because blight has never found them. Well, anyway, this, as the story goes, this, this guy and his family um, grew these massive chestnut trees in Iowa. And you want, to, you want to be really careful here with that center spot. You don't want to push hard and knock out fibers because you could get a deep gouge there if you did that. Now, I'm really close to having the bottom I want, but it's a little flat on the bottom. So i got to make another pass here to get a good curved bottom shape. Anyway, so what he did is he took pictures of this chestnut one one picture a month and he did it for years and he he required or he, he requested that his son continue it after he passed away and that his son con continued it and supposedly there was a flip book of these all these photos you can actually see this chestnut tree growing over many many years all right so we're going to use this technique again to fill these cracks in the center of the of the bowl as well, just like we did on the exterior. Those crack, cracks need to be filled so they don't expand and cause any more issues. So you can check that out. Go to turnerwoodbowl.com forward slash crack and you can get all the details on that. Um, basically, again, just work that glue down into the wood well and then sand with the grain until you've coated over that glue and you're good to go. You don't have to wait for the glue to dry or anything, which is really nice. Uh, it's pretty much fixed down into that crack and it's going to go ahead and harden and cure and 
do its thing. And you want to work small areas at a time. Don't don't try to do a big area all at once. This is probably more than I should be doing at one time. Probably should only do like an inch or two at a time. Do it really well. And again, those shavings work out good for kind of a fill and also to take some of that excess glue off the surface. Yeah, so as far as American forestry and American trees, the uh, there's really not much that tops the American chestnut as far as being a legend. Um, unfortunately, it's no longer exists now. There are there are places that are trying to bioengineer versions or strands of the chestnut that are blight resistant, and they're having some success with that. They're they're mixing it with other types of chestnuts that are resistant to the to the blight. But there again, there's only you know handfuls of those compared to what the way this tree grew naturally. I'm standing here and I'm I'm again I'm just working around just like I did on the next year, just working to smooth out any high spots or any tool marks. Whenever you're turning or sanding, you want to make sure that you sand hand sand across the center. You don't want to sand across the center with the lathe on because you'll essentially it's almost impossible to stop in the in the dead center with the sanding pad and if you sand up to it and you sand past it you just sand the area in front of and across the, the center twice so you'll make like a little moat in the middle so you want to do this by hand with the lathe off so you don't get that now i'm going to be carefully sanding the edge of this making sure that i'm i'm just using the edge of the sanding pad and i'm orienting it so that it's flush with the surface as i go around this natural edge log or the bow blank and you can see as I'm, I'm basically following the contour of the log when I'm on the side I'm down lay down at an angle almost perpendicular but when I come across the top of those wings now I'm flat up and so you got to really be careful if you don't pay attention to the natural contour of the natural edge bowl here you're just going to grind down that edge and put a new shape on it I really don't want to do that with this I want to I want to maintain that edge but I also want to sand it smooth so if any bark debris or any kind of other um, matter is on there, I want to remove that. And of course, make sure you're wearing your very good quality respirator. If you've got any questions about that, check out my website, turnerwoodbull.com. And up at the top, click on Recommended Gear, and there's a Safety Gear section in there. I've got a uh, 3M respirator that I use that's a full face mask that has replaceable filters that are designed to uh, block out dust particles from wood. The, the thing about that is you want to make sure that you're doing it because there you can go and you can do this many times without one and think that everything's okay. You might have a little cough here and there or whatever and then it goes away. But you're actually inhaling those really fine particul particulates and they're going to stay in your lungs. So here you can see what I'm doing is I'm sanding and I'm stopping right up to that center. Like I said, I'm not sanding up to that center. There's really not enough material here to be sanding this with the lathe on. But if you were to do that, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure you stop short of that center and then sand it by hand like you're doing right here. It's going to be much easier and you're going to have a better result going sanding by hand. Again, check out my video on sanding wood bowls and you get all the details of how I sand. But I'm working through the grits. I started at 120. I'm going to be sanding uh, 180, 240, and then 320 until we get a nice smooth finish here. And this wood has turned out to be really nice. It takes the... It takes the sandpaper really well. It sands super nice. It's a really nice smooth finish. All right, now I'm going to use my jam chuck to reverse turn this and shape the foot of this bowl. This particular jam chuck is designed to fit my uh, four inch or what is that? Uh, 10 millimeter? Maybe 10 millimeter chuck. I, I do, unfortunately, I'm doing everything in inches. I'm learning. I'm trying to do more for everybody that's in metric, but I believe it's about a, uh, a 10 millimeter. So if you want to check out that video on how to make a jam chuck, and check that out. It's in my collection here at YouTube. So you make this, you make the, put the jam chuck in and you use a piece of padding and I'm using a piece of foam to pad it so it doesn't get scuffed up. All the sanding work we just did doesn't get scuffed up. 
And what I noticed when I set this up was it's not turning as true as I would like. There's a pretty good wobble in the shoulder. So what I did is I, I went and I looked at it one more time and that wobble is just too much. So I said, I went back and looked at the jam chuck itself and over time the jam chuck, because it's drying and shaping and turning, it's gone a little bit out of center and it's got a little wobble to it. So I went ahead and I'm trimming up this jam chuck so that it's turning a little truer now. You want to have a flat area on it like that so you don't have like a, um, a spike that goes into your bowl and burnishes a mark on your bowl. It's better to have a, a ring like that that holds onto a larger area. Okay, it's not perfectly true, but it's very close. So we're going to use that. Now I'm going to take the shoulder down a little bit. And if you want to learn about how to remove a tenon and all the details to that, check out my video. Again, that's in my collection here on YouTube of how to remove a tenon. So I'm going to, I want to flatten out the base of where the foot's going to be. That's going to be right there. I'm not going to be using this tenon. Instead of making a push cut towards the tail stock, I'm going to basically make push cuts towards the head stock here. And that's going to give me a, um, a more secure cut as well because I'm basically just pushing the, the bull onto the, the jam chuck. When you make a side cut, you can, you can apply too much pressure. You can loosen it up and move it potentially. So here I'm using a, a shear scrape. You can see the really fine shavings coming off of that and I'm merging that edge where the, the new cut was for the outside of the foot to the exterior of the bowl. You want to stop periodically and check it and see how it looks. I got a little bit of a groove there. It's still cut. I need to smooth out a little bit more. Just make light cuts. There's no, no need to be in a rush with this. Just make really nice light cuts. And again, this is shear scrape. So I have the handle downward. The tool is pointed up at about a 40, 45 degree angle. And I'm just shaving that edge right there. So while it's still secure and it's mounted here, it's really easy to sand it. So I'll bring up the sander and go ahead and sand that transition area. And I'll move through all the grits here. I'm not going to bore you guys with all of it, but I will move through all the grits here and make sure that all of that area is sanded nicely before I continue shaping the bottom of the foot and then take that tenon off. So bring the tool rest back and then I'm going to shape the inside of that foot with a little bit of a concave curve to it. I want to make sure that it's not flat bottomed and, and so it doesn't rock or become wobbly while it's sitting on a table. So I want that to be concave. So I'm cutting out a little bit of material in the, mater in the middle of that foot and I'm going to take the tenon down to a smaller size. Just really light push cuts here, keeping the bull gouge at about a nine o'clock position. So I'm further increasing that concave curve. Now, if you're not comfortable going any farther than this, you can stop right here and just sand that nub off. I'm going to use my detail spindle gouge and I'm going to turn this off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up that concave curve right there and I'm going to nibble the tenon down just a little bit. It's more of a nub. It's not much of a tenon anymore. I'm just going to nibble that down so it's getting pretty small. You want to check also and make sure that you've got a good connection here and the wood's not damaged. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to push forward and as I'm doing this I'm getting to a little thin area. I'm going to turn the power off. I'm going to make it a little bit narrower here. If you want to see what happens, okay, so I'm going to apply pressure here and I'm powering it off and pushing in and at the same time it's going to sever that off. Again, if you're not comfortable doing that, that's no problem. You can just sand that nub off. It'll, it'll sand down pretty quickly. If you want to see what happens if you don't check if that nub is secure or has uh, solid wood, go check out my Nutty Bowl video because I actually had a wormhole uh, void in that little nub and I thought I could continue with it in it. <laughs> it uh, it decided to do other things. So what I'm doing here is I'm just hand sanding that. And what I do is I rotate the bull back and forth so I don't have some uh, a, a groove in, on one side compared to the other. Try to evenly sand this down so it's not, it's not apparent that this was done by hand. So I just continue smoothing that out until it's done.
Now I like to sign my bowls with a a wood burner, and this is a um, just a real simple wood burner that's got a pin tip on it. And I like to go through and and um, just take my time and and sign these really nice. The um, each wood is a little bit different. If you have a, a wood with a moisture content in it, you may have to turn the temperature up a little bit higher. I was really surprised how nice the chestnut handled this um, this particular temperature, and it just it's burned really well. It's relatively dry. I have no idea how long this the guy that got this wood. I don't know how long he's had it cut and how long it's been uh, equalizing, but. Um, it seems to be pretty dry, and it's receiving the um, the wood burner really well. I always put the species on the bottom of my bowls, and after you do a few hundred bowls, you think you'll remember all of them, but after you do a few hundred of them and you go back to one, and you're like, mm, I don't remember what that was. So it's always a good idea to put it on it because everybody will ask, what kind of wood is this? And this one, of course, is super special because this is American chestnut, and you just don't get this every day. So... Take your time and make a really nice uh, signature on the bottom of your bowl, and you're, it's it's really nice. It's kind of a nice way to finish it all off and have a really nice uh, completed bowl. But if you need to turn the temperature up, you can do that, and it'll it, it'll burn more. Just you know, kind of got to play with it. Now the finish I'm using here is tried and true Danish oil. I also use their original, which is Danish oil and or which is actually linseed oil. The Danish oil is linseed oil, but their original has linseed oil and beeswax in it. Um, I was going to put a coat of this Danish oil on just kind of have a nice base coat to um, to have something to show at the end of this video and think I might come back later and put the original on it as well. But I was surprised how well the Danish oil uh, uh, shows on this wood. I mean, it's it's really, really, really nice. A lot of times, the uh, different woods that I've turned will kind of soak up the Danish oil, and you got to come back with several coats. I've put a second coat on it, but I really haven't uh, needed it. What I like about this is it's kind of got a low luster. It's not super shiny once it once it dries, but it's got a nice low luster. And this chestnut just took the wood beautifully. So I can see how craftsmen would have loved this uh, for making furniture and and any kind of woodworking project. This is just beautiful wood to work with. And it's lightweight, strong, really beautiful grain. I'm just really, really pleased with this whole piece. I'm just so glad that it actually turned out. There it is, an American chestnut natural edge bowl. We weren't able to save the bark, which I didn't think we were gonna be able to. Um, however, we were able to fill those cracks and hopefully that technique that you you uh, got to see there with the glue and the sandpaper. Hopefully that's something you'll get to use in the future. And I got to tell you, whew, I'm glad this one's done. You know, this is a pretty simple, kind of ordinary, basic look looking kind of bowl. When it sits on my shelf, people might not think much of it, but it definitely has a lot of meaning. And uh, if you're into trees and, and history, this is, uh, this, is pretty, this is a pretty big deal right here. At least it is for me. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. It was, this is probably the most nervous I've been turning a bowl and it's, it's a little guy and it's really simple, but it was a little nerve wracking. I didn't want to mess it up. Anyway, uh, if you like this video, please click that like button. And if you're not subscribing, subscribe, please. I've got tons of videos and you're not going to want to miss them. Click that bell and you'll be notified. Uh, leave me a comment below. Tell me what you thought. And, uh, let me know if you've ever turned any American chestnut or if you have any stories about American chestnut, I'd love to hear them. And I, I'd love to see those in the comments and share those with everyone. So like I'd like to say at the end of my videos, thanks for watching and happy turning.